morning, good morning. It's great to be here. I used to live in Grand Rapids in the 90s. The transformation in this town is really remarkable. It's a privilege to be here to talk about the ideas that change the way we see, think, and do. And the arts are a great part of that. Uh, I'm a little nervous. We've all seen the TED Talks on television and, and video. But being on this side, I can tell you, is a little, uh, a little challenging. There's little clickers down there telling me how much time I've got. Uh, Reminds me of my favorite uh, joke about the bridegroom uh, on his wedding night. Uh, and this best man came up to him and said, so, so how you doing? And he said, well, no. He said, I'm all right. He said, I know what I have to do. I just hope I can make it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to kind of make it interesting for you today. <laughs> Not in that way, of course. So let's, <laughs> how do we define X in terms of innovation. I'm an arts educator. I'm in the process of how people learn and put all this kind of stuff together. Um, and uh, I think it's a combination of multipliers. It's people, it's learning, it's education, it's the arts, it's history. They're all X multipliers. They all exponentially go on from there. Innovation is not an isolated process. I think sometimes we, th we think it is, but it's not. It's the sum of all of those parts, all those multipliers. And the arts have been a deep aspect of that innovation for years, and they're gonna matter even more in our future. So innovate, little definition here, make changes in something established, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, and products. That doesn't happen because voila, we decide we're gonna be uh, innovative. It, it comes over an accumulation of time and data and experience, or it's introducing something new, such as a product or developing existing ones. Sometimes we talk about innovation as if, as if it's an inanimate process. Uh, it can be mass produced. Um, it's a quick panacea to the challenges of our time, and certainly we think that it's gonna be the answer to all of our issues here in the state of Michigan. Not. Uh, <laughs> but it will help. Um, the, the notion of innovation investment zones that I hear various governors around the country talking about don't work without innovative people and innovative cultures. You can't people teach people to just innovate, but you can create an environment in which innovation is critical. So what is innovation and how do you foster it? I think it's a state of time in a mature society. I think it's the sum of learning and experience and knowledge and the arts from previous centuries. It's a 21st century phenomenon because we've arrived at this point in time. Last night I was talking to Mickey, one of our speakers, and we, we couldn't have had this conference 30 years ago. It just wouldn't have been possible. And the, the wonderful presentations you're hearing from people about interesting, innovative things that they're doing are here because of the time in which we live. Uh, it's a 21st century phenomenon based on what happened in the 14th and the 18th and the 20th centuries. And we can talk about innovation today because over time we've created these vast storehouses of information that can be accessed, accessed ubiquitously anywhere at any time. And it helps us then to process and look at how we learn and create differently over time. People ask me all the time, can, how can I make my kid more innovative? Can my kid be more innovative with the arts? Well, it's possible that that environment will allow that to create, but it's not gonna happen instantaneously. And their ability to be creative and innovative over time depends on where we are as a society as we move forward. The creation and sharing of information has been a part of the human experience since the very beginning of time. The first written language in cave paintings of 40,000 years ago uh, allowed us to have a perspective of language based on huge sculptures that were carved into the top of these, uh, of these uh, caves. And as a result, that allowed us to move to written language that was first artistic, and then we moved from there to smaller figures and hieroglyphs and petroglyphs, and ultimately to small characters as our quality of communication and complexity of communication in, uh, increased. Of course, uh, it allowed us then to see a progression of the arts throughout the time, as we're seeing on these slides here, uh, that mirrors the education of history and the education uh, of the arts at the same time. Uh, it has blurred us and allowed us to move into a more pervasive form of which the arts have been hand in hand with education through all, through all time. <clears throat> it has uh, blurred the lines of access and privilege and status and wealth to provide universal education for the arts. And as we accelerate through the ages, we find this remarkable place of the arts and education in society um, where we have technique and pedagogy and genre and motif and sound and sight and color and movement and consonance and dissonance, literal to abstract, of plays, poems and histories, photography, motion picture, great works of music, marching faster and faster through time and history with increasing technologies and viewpoints, 
reacting to the complexity of issues facing each generation in each society in revolutionary new ways. It's the invention of the printing press in 1440 that started us on the pathway to the innovation that we enjoy today and that we seek to replicate for future times. <clears throat> it created an exponential increase in the importance and the value of the arts and education because information could finally be shared. It provided a system of mass distribution of ideas and information in books and libraries, newspapers and scientific research that slowly at first, because it took three months to travel from London to Rome, and then with increasing speed, crossing borders, cultures, race, and class. It created revolutions from political to scientific and artistic. It shared arts and shared cultures and helped us share values. And it dissolved the issue of class and access in the arts and education. Going back to Toffler's Waves of Change here, I think there's a pattern in this time continuum of the arts and education as we look over the centuries. Each period of change and growth uses learning and information differently. It's a hierarchy, really. And so if we look at the currencies of these four major movements, uh, if you agree with Tof Toffler's uh, particular theory, you'll see that uh, if innovation is the new currency for our future, for the virtual age, then invention was the currency of the agrarian industrial society. Education was what brought us from the agrarian society forward into the industrial society. Invention was the way that we allowed improvements in our life in the industrial society. It took longer between inventions, but we invented and moved things further and further along. And then as we moved into an information society, roughly in 1963 with the invention of the transistor chip, we saw that the organization of information and how we use that organization to meet various social ends and educational ends and technological ends helped us move forward. We learned how to organize the vast store of information we were creating. And finally now in the virtual age, we have innovation. It's the ability to take this accumulation of hundreds of years of uh, learning and experience and use it to the, to the good ends that we see being used at this conference today. Um, if I were a mathematician, which I'm not, um, I would create an algorithm for this process. And so bear with me as you read these lines here. Greater access to education and the arts times increased information equals more ideas times the decreasing time between inventions and ideas, which equals increased innovation. Well, you can see why I'm not a mathematician, but it's the issue of time and accumulated information together that gives us the potential that we have at our current time in our lives. When we think that there were a 60 year gap of time between the discovery of electricity and the first electric generator, and then 40 years then until the invention of the telegraph, and then 30 years to the telephone, 20 years to the phonograph, 70 years to radio, and so on and so on. Now the average lifespan of a new piece of technology today is about less than two months. I mean, last year's iPad, quite frankly, was obsolete when it was shipped. I'm on my second one already. How many are waiting for the third? How many are waiting for their fifth iPhone? All those are advances that are happening so quickly that it's virtually impossible to keep up with that flow. If we look at Bloom's taxonomy, um, we're, we're talking about in, in the uh, era of um, uh, innovation are the upper level parts of Bloom's taxonomy. We tend to focus in education right now way too much on the bottom, simple knowledge, comprehension, and application but it's the analysis and synthesis and evaluation that allows us to move up to the creativity that we aspire to on such a regular basis. So the ready storehouses of vast information that we have are helping people to think differently. Last uh, week on campus, we had one of our senior, uh, uh, senior uh, visual art thesis uh, shows, and I was struck by the combination of interdisciplinary uh, visual art projects that use creative writing uh, and science. Uh, in this case, uh, ben Corwin took a series of cubes and other objects in which were embedded found pieces of art and organized them and then watched them melt over the course of the, uh, of the evening. So the art itself changed, not only helping us discover new art and new shapes and new forms, but also changing the very nature and relationship of the chemicals to each other throughout the process. Uh, it was a fascinating way to look uh, at this information. And students are now using and applying those things on a regular basis. We had a student, Victoria Maxfield, who was totally, completely scared to death by bugs. She so wasn't doing particularly well in our biology class. 
but she became fascinated with, with the, the exosystem of bugs and decided that uh, there was such an incredible structure of the carapace and the, the outer shell of various beetles and bugs that she began to weave this literally into her own work. She's a fiber artist, and so she created 36 of these different bugs, all made out of gorgeous sequins, completely to scale um, and in complete replication uh, of the actual uh, bug itself. Uh, here, these are made out of sequins and silk thread uh, in gold and silver, and uh, it's really in a remarkable way that she uses it and describes this in her own writing of how she uh, has this particular type of understanding. So we're still trying to solve some of the same issues that we've been looking at for a long period of time. Uh, faster communication, cures for disease, better health, ways to better living in our society, solving complex environmental and human issues, organizing, analyzing, and finding new ideas. In many ways, being innovative is much harder than being inventive because it requires a continuous process. Our ability to innovate is directly tied to our ability to be creative and knowing how to use all of this information differently because we see it from different angles. And then those creative applications are nurtured and shaped and informed by people's experience with the arts. For me, I'm a lifelong arts educator and arts advocate. And my point is this, the value of art in our lives and the amount that we provide to our children does matter in the innovation age and in particular the age that follows it, whatever we choose to call it. This is an X variable that requires even greater definition. How many in this room took music courses in schools, elementary, middle school, high school? How many participated in a band, orchestra, and choir? How many took visual art? Any dancers out there? Do we have some people who wrote creative writing, short stories or poems? Or do we have any filmmakers? There's a reason why the United States has more patents issued any year than any other developed country on Earth and many of those countries combined. It's because of our historical commitment to education and since the 1920s, we have not only expanded universal education across the country, we've also added in many cases universal arts programs across the country and vibrant after-school programs uh, that helped provide and extend the artistic experience to so many. The arts do matter. It's an X variable that we have to invest in in the future and other societies are investing in, those, uh, in, in the arts. At Interlock, and some of us have been spending quite a bit of time recently in China, and there's a reason that there's 100 million young people playing the piano, and 70 million people playing the violin, and 40 million people playing the clarinet. There's a clear reason why the arts are being moved into Chinese society. It's to break the kind of the lockstep way that they tend to look at issues and solutions and find greater creativity amongst their young people. It's a lesson we need to think about. The key word here is access. Future generations will not be more innovative than ours if we take the arts away. And there's a disturbing trend here that as an arts educator who travels across this country, I, I'm quite concerned about. I think we're starting to take the arts for granted. And in part, it's because they're so easy to get today. Uh, amazing videos, the YouTubes, the great uh, operas going back, you know, 100 years that are on special recordings, the Mets uh, available on the weekend. You've got your iPod, your iPhone. Everything is completely accessible to you, digital art. Uh, it has made it so easy that we have lost our connection with craft and understanding, and it's the craft and understanding that allows us to understand the different angles and perspectives that the arts give us on problem solving and solution. So the doing and the creating is just as important as the consuming and the understanding. And no matter how tough that first clarinet sound or violin may sound, or how primitive the drawing of a five-year-old, those are critical processes in the ability of people to innovate in our future. And so we're starting to make, as a result, decisions on the arts that are expendable in the education process. There's a phrase I've been using uh, lately that I think is, bears us a, a great deal of understanding. The more access we have to the arts and society, the less relevant the study of the arts is becoming in our schools. That's a shocking statement to me and a, and a sad one. But the fact of the matter is, I'm afraid that as we begin to retrench in our education programs, we decide to, uh, what's more important than something else. We're gonna see the arts begin to fade rather than increase for all children. The next two years alone, budget cuts in the state of Michigan could cause us to lose significant percentage, percentages of our arts educators. It's forcing our schools to focus only on the lower end of Bloom's taxonomy 
instead of the hiring where we need to be. Some will argue with me uh, that an education uh, or uh, experience in the arts is not necessarily an education in the arts. Well, after school programs will pick this up. You can go take a, a, a program for youth at the, uh, the symphony or at the Grand Rapids uh, Museum. True, but not all will have access to that. And that is the real key for us. Um, and so while that may happen, it, we've got to be very careful that at the same time we're not cutting off the very legs that will give us the ability to walk into the 21st century later and later with greater, greater success. Uh, I find it an interesting oxymoron that at this period of time when we have the greatest access to the arts, we really are thinking that we might take the arts out of, out of our schools. And as a, as a word to my fellow colleagues in arts education, we can't teach the same way that we taught uh, uh, the arts 30 years ago, nor can schools teach math or science the same way either. It's a very different time, we have to adapt to that. So that's a challenge for arts educators. But I hope that we are very mindful of the fact uh, in this period of time uh, that we might really think about this as the arts and innovation and education are deeply linked together to who we are right now that we can have a conference like this and look at some of the phenomenal things that are happening in the world uh, with us today. So to kind of underscore that process, I thought that jazz would be an, a wonderful metaphor. And I brought uh, three students from Interlochen uh, who are here and we're gonna have a little dialogue about what this means uh, to us and how they go about the process of innovating uh, through the arts. Uh, three, their names would be up here, so they're gonna introduce themselves now. <laughs> Hello, I'm Benjamin Barg, I'm a senior, and I'm from Yakima, Washington. I'm Nick Myers, I'm a junior, and I'm from Cadillac, Michigan. My name is Matthew Buckner, I'm a senior, and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we're all here to play Password, no. Right. <laughs> So, if jazz is a metaphor for the process of innovation, and it's a question of a layering experience, when you first hear those first notes, what goes through your head? And Ben's gonna play the first uh, few notes of the, of the tune they're gonna do today. All right, you obviously know it, take the a train, good. Oh, well, now some of your previous experience may not have been there, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> not the B train, the A train. So as he throws that to you when you first start, even though you might know it, it's a completely clean canvas because it never is quite the same either time. Uh, Matt, what goes through your mind as you, as you start that process? Well, it's kind of difficult to explain exactly what's going through our heads while we're performing because it's a very instinctive process. But um, one metaphor I like to use is it's very much like a business meeting you go into a meeting and you have an agenda. For us, our agenda is the melody, and wherever we go with the with the song, um, it, we may bring our previous experiences into it, but it's always re it's always relating to that melody in some way. So you use the word instinctive, which I think is interesting. And Ben, we talked a little bit about that. What what is instinctive about this process? Well, I, I think the thing that the reason instinctiveness is important is because when we're playing jazz, what we're trying to access is the part of our brains and the part of our, uh, part of our knowledge that isn't so conscious. Um, that's where inspiration comes from and that's where creativity comes from. And in order to access that instinctiveness, we need to have our technique down. We need to have a lot of knowledge of the traditions of jazz so that we can access this inner creativity and have that not, and don't, not have barriers to that. Right. Um, there's a three-step process that uh, your, your teacher in Lachlan has talked about and we talked about the other day uh, that I think is really interesting. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the process is Im imitate, emulate, and innovate. The idea being that you start out uh, imitating the masters of the tradition. In this case, this would be the master jazz musicians like Louis Armstrong, John Coltrane, and Miles Davis. And then soon after, you emulate, so you start to introduce elements of your own personality and your own creativity in, into that. And finally, you innovate by uh, um, taking that idea but going completely into the realm of your own creativity. Right. So, uh, Matt, just a couple of thoughts about the, the kinds of experiences you have to have to be able to hear what he's doing as he throws different chord changes at you. And h how do you pull that all together from your past? Well, for me, um it's, it's very much like a three-way conversation. I hear what Ben is doing, and if he, if he uh, would play something that would remind me of one of the great jazz musicians of the past, um, I would 
support that in a way that historically would make sense and um, then bring my own background into it. And it just kind of keeps going like that where it's a, like a dialogue, a musical dialogue. Right. Is it ever the same? Do you f have fun messing with each other's heads as you throw things at them? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. it can be the same if, you're, if you don't have your head into it and you're not alert, you're not listening. But the idea is that uh, you're always ready and you're always taking the part out of your, of your mind out that's worrying and that's fearful and just allowing the things to happen. And if that happens, then it's, I think it's never the right. same. Uh, ben is a mathematician supreme as well as being a pianist. You're gonna go to Columbia next year. Yes. Uh, you, what's, the, what's the mix between math and, and music? I think for me the thing that's most fascinating about the connection between math and music is I think at the heart of both disciplines there is something irrational and something that's beyond our capability to understand. Like I don't necessarily understand everything about the uh, creative capabilities inside of me and in a lot of ma studies of mathematics there are so many properties of numbers that seem almost chaotic and I see the connection and it's, it's very interesting yeah. for me to explore that. Matt, you're going to the University of Miami next year, and yep. you made a very conscious decision. Why? Well, because um, as I want to uh, start a career in music, and in order to do that, along with any career, you, I want to get as wide of a background as I can, and I think going to somewhere with such diversity um, would really benefit me okay. in that way. Now, you haven't heard Nick talk, because he's a little shy, <laughs> but <laughs> Nick said there's one thing that you need to know about the bass player, and that is? Um, I'm just kind of like the glue that keeps things together uh, with the rhythm and the harmony. Right. So. so there you go. That's the perfect bass player response. And they did it all without PowerPoint. <laughs>